Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. To the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King. Sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Let's pray together. Our Father, we want to exalt you. We have in song, we have with our giving, just what you've given to us, Lord. And yet we want to exalt you in our hearts. We want to exalt you in truth. We want to worship you such. So I pray that your word would be accepted and heard and spoken with truth and that you would be exalted in our hearts. The peoples of the earth have become children of Abraham because of Christ's exaltation. I pray that we would see that Christ is to be exalted in this song. He sits at your right hand, the ascended Christ, and reigns there. And we glorify his name together. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's important to take note of the titles when we come to the Psalms. They were there in the Hebrew and recognized as part of the inspired text. This particular title we read to the choir master. This was a song to be led by the worship leader of the congregation of Israel, a psalm of the sons of Korah. And we've been studying since Psalm 42, the second book of the Psalms began there. We've been studying so far just psalms written by the sons of Korah or compiled by the sons of Korah, and this is one of them. The occasion of the psalm is not particularly known. Some believe that it fits very well. In fact, the word, uh, the wording of this psalm fits very well in verse 5 of Psalm 47. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. It fits very well with what we see with David bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 6.15. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a horn. And there's an idea of the, the ascension of God that has taken place in this psalm. Whatever the historical occasion surrounding it, I think its placement between Psalm 46 and 48, if you have time later to read those psalms together, sometimes we need to see how these psalms were put together in sequence in Scripture. These psalms have to do with God, the high king of all the earth, the greatest king of all, which in those days to us kind of rolls off our back. But in those days, everything was a competition 
with who is the greatest king. And this psalm, these three psalms together really have to do with God being the most high God, El El Yon, who reigns in Zion, who reigns among his people, the king of kings. And indeed, he reigns over all things. And so these psalms are for the worship of the God who reigns above every name. These psalms are written for the glory of his name and the joy of the saints who worship him. The theme of this psalm can be summarized well from, I believe, Romans chapter 3, verse 29. Is God the God of the Jews only? Who is to ascribe glory to God, to this God, the God of gods, the King of kings? Just the Jews? Paul says, no, Paul is a Jew. He says he is not the God of the Jews only. Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Rhetorically, he says, and then he answers it. Yes, of Gentiles also. Sometimes we have an argument within the church as to how we should view the church. Should we view the church as sort of a second act of redemption? Sort of an afterthought when it comes to what God planned in eternity? Some teach that the church is sort of an afterthought, yet what he really intended to do was to save Israel, and then when they rejected him, God changed course, and now he reaches out to the Gentiles and to the world to save the world. And we see in this psalm that that is not the case. We see in this psalm that God is the God of Israel, and he is the God of the Gentiles also. There is one God. And he is the God of the Jews and of the Gentiles. And we see that foreshadowed in the psalm, the same thing that we read in Ephesians 3, 6. If you want to write that down in your notes, look that up later. We may touch on it in the sermon this morning. I want to bring this thought to your mind. Don't cut off the Old Testament. I've been, tell- I've been preaching it. I'm a preacher. I've been preaching that recently a lot. Don't cut yourself off from the Old Testament. Your faith depends on these two testaments being understood together. You don't accept the one and cut the other off in either direction. You do that to your own destruction or to your own hurt if you do it at all. What we see in the Old Testament is often described in the New Testament as mystery. In Psalm 46, we saw the mystery of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been seeing that that mystery of the incarnation, which is so profound. How does God become man and dwell among us? That's a mystery to us. But the way that the New Testament talks about that is that is mystery that is for our faith. That means it informs us in the new. Well, what does that mean? That means as we see these two acts of God's redemption, the Old and the New Testament, come together, we see mysteries that are far too high for us to comprehend, namely the incarnation as I'm talking about. But as it's being revealed in the Old, it becomes information for our faith to grab onto and say, yes, Lord, you are true. So although we cannot comprehend these truths in a sense of how do we know the mind of God? He who is infinite, how can we grasp him? How can we make sense of the God-man in totality? Well, the, the Bible says you can't. Not in totality, but we can know what he's revealed to us. And you see, the very fact that God reveals these mysteries to us in two acts is for our faith to grow and say, yes, these things are true. And so that's what he's doing today as well. What he's doing today as well in this psalm, for us today anyway, is he's teaching us of a profound mystery. And that mystery regards the church. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 3. Actually, just go there. (laughs) We're just going to get right off the notes right away. Ephesians chapter 3. He talks about, in verse 6, this mystery is that The Gentiles are fellow heirs, 
It's important because the psalm is going to talk about that today. Members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Who are they fellow heirs with? Well, in chapter 2, it's the commonwealth of Israel. Verse 12, we were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So if you don't have Jewish ancestry or weren't a part of the covenant people of God in the Old Testament, he's saying to you, that was your condition. But if you are in Christ, that is not your condition now. You are one with the people of God. You see that? Verse 6, chapter 3, the mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise. How? In Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now we go back to our psalm. First point, triumphal joy, verses 1 and 2. How do we first see this in the psalm that you and I are, are included in this this joy, this, this one body. In this psalm, listen to how this begins. And you might be offended by it. If you don't have the spirit of Christ, you will be offended by it. Clap your hands, all peoples. All peoples is, that's a directive towards the Gentile nations. All peoples there. Shout to God with loud uh, shout songs of joy triumphal shouts verse 2 for Yahweh the most high El El Yon is to be feared you have a compartment in your minds for that shout shouts of joy for God is to be feared do we have theology that is full enough for us to rejoice while we tremble Psalm chapter 2. He is the most high and he is to be feared. A great king over all the earth. He says all people. And this regards the nations of the world. In contrast to the sons of Jacob. To Israel. And these are they who the psalmist says should be clapping their hands in expressive joy because of the triumph of Yahweh. But who has he triumphed over? In a sense, he's triumphed over us, the peoples of the world. He is triumphing over the nations of the world. Yahweh is seen rightly here as the most high being over all. And that would have been through triumph. As we understand this psalm, a right vision of him is that he is to be feared. He is to be reverenced greatly in our hearts because he is a great king over all the earth. Now, not all the earth accepted his kingship, did they? In fact, a very small portion of the world at the time that the psalmist is writing this were actually worshiping Yahweh. But he says, this is for you, peoples of the earth. This psalm teaches us in these first two verses that God's supremacy is not merely over the people of promise as we would expect it to be. We would expect that this would be sung, that great shouts of joy would be rendered up by the people who would gather in Jerusalem to worship God together at his holy temple. But he's telling in this psalm the peoples of the world to raise their voices because God has triumphed even over them. You ever heard uh, from your parents when they disciplined you or they corrected you or they brought you into line with what they wanted you to do? This is for your own good. You didn't really like that, did you? When you heard that. In a sense, this is sort of how the psalm begins, by saying, God's triumph over you is for your own good. Loud shouts of joy. You know, there is a philosophy that's come 
into the church. It's creeping into the church more and more. And that philosophy says, leave the people in the world, leave the, the people who have not been touched by society, leave them to themselves. We've done enough harm in the world, right? Postmodernism said that truth can only be known within the context of your subjective truths, your, your collective truths. So our Western society has its collective truths. That's good, for, that's good for us, or maybe it's not good. We can change those collective truths, right? But, but the indigenous peoples have their collective truths, and so you leave them with their, because that's just as valid as ours. And in some ways, we feel the weight of that, don't we? The West has not been a, a bastion of virtue everywhere it's touched, has it? We've done a lot of harm, oftentimes with the good that came from the missionary movement. We know what that's like here in Hawaii, 1820, the missionaries coming over here and doing much good. Well, along with that, you have people that see dollar signs as their God. And that's you, you saw that happen in the history of Hawaii. Those dollar signs start taking over. Corruption starts coming in. And all of a sudden, now you're seeing the movement of Christianity conflated with greed and oppression. And we see that happen throughout the world. And so you hear a lot of voices saying, uh, Christians, we have to be careful. We, we cannot just go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature because those people have every right to believe what they want to believe and they're happy in doing so. And if you fall for that, not only do you not see their great need, but neither do you see their great hope, the great joy. If the, if the Christian church starts hearing because of the failures of society, we, the church, must not bring the gospel to every creature. The people that will die in their sin will face a righteous God in judgment. And not only that, this psalm is saying they will not have the joy of salvation. You here today were reached, if you're a Gentile, because missionaries, evangelists, preachers went into the world to pagan people. You know, the West wasn't Christian originally. England, Saxony, where my ancestors came from in Norway, Higgins, and I am so thankful that the gospel came there. And we need to be about the vision that hears from God that says to the peoples in the world, Christ came for your good. And not let the faults of our society or civilization hinder the church in our obedience to take the gospel to all the nations. And we need to pray that we do that without any hindrances of sin in us. But how does God triumph and in what way does he call these people, the peoples of the earth, to raise their voices in praise to him. Well, it's sort of a process. The psalm begins just with the implication that this is good, but it doesn't give the reason why. And so we're going to have to sort of wait for the answer. Secondly, we see the triumphant church, verses 3 and 4. So the choir master is leading the nations in worship in verses 1 and 2. But now he turns his attention to God's covenant people, to Israel. God's saving power and prerogative must be seen in verses 3 and 4. And first, we need to see that God, that, that we are his people because of God's power. He subdued, listen to this, he subdued peoples under us. This is where the victory of verses 1 and 2 is a subjection. They're, they're crying out with joy to the Most High God is one that is understood in this psalm because they have been subjected to God. 
His, he has subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. Verse, verse uh, 4 says he chose our heritage for us. Verse 3, how the mystery was made. I'm sorry, Ephesians 3. I'm in Ephesians 3. I got to get back to Psalm 47 here. Verse 3, he subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob who he loves. Do you understand that this is speaking of the triumph of God's people over the peoples of this world? Now, this was historically true when God brought Israel out of Egypt. We know that God did so to show his greatness, but he also showed the greatness of his people when he was pouring out his plagues on the Egyptians. What did he tell Moses? I'm doing this to make a distinction between you, Egypt, and my people, Israel. The plagues would touch Egypt and not touch Israel at all. To show that God was with his people. When he entered into, when he, his people entered into Canaan, they left in their wake the Ammonites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, or I'm sorry, the Je Jebusites, the Moabites, the Amorites. And these nations eventually, even in David's and Solomon's reign, began to give tribute to Israel, to pay tribute to them. And these things are examples for us. You know, the, the church is despondent, I think, these days, isn't it? Too many Christians are hanging their heads saying, woe is us. It seems like the gates of hell are triumphing over the church. You read the news very much these days, it sure looks like it. But this is where the problem of conflating America with the kingdom of Christ causes a lot of trouble. Now we need to be, I think it's right that Americans, that Christ, as Christians, we are, we are good citizens of our society, of America. We want to see America succeed, don't we? You don't want evil for your neighbors, do you? You, you don't want evil for your children growing up here. We want to, we want to say with, the scriptures that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And so we want to call our fellow citizens of this nation to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we see the tide rolling as it is and the speed and the succession of evil, we tend to lose heart and we tend to say, wow, how do we overcome? But this text is for us to see that God has overcome the world before. How did God bring out Israel from Egypt? Through their own might? Through, the, through any sort of a logistical effort that Israel put together? No. He won the victory for them, didn't he? And how did he bring them into Canaan? By his strong arm, he brought them into Canaan. And so the triumphal praise of God's people is that God will do it. And he's promised us that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And so as the author to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, lift up your drooping hands. Heads. Lift them up. You have not yet resisted unto death, he tells them to encourage them. <laughs> That's what he says in Hebrews. You haven't resisted unto death. And what will that do to us? God's first thing he wants us to see in this psalm of praise, in these verses where we see the triumphal people of God, is to know that he subdues people under us. The nations under our feet. This is exactly what I preached on in Ephesians chapter 2, the chapter 1, the, the end of he, Ephesians chapter 1, going into chapter 2. This power that is at work in us is the same power which God demonstrated when he raised Jesus from the dead. And we don't live like it. And he says there that all things are under his feet, and we don't live like it. I don't often light upon that truth 
as much as I do the news of one sin that is being celebrated after another in our culture. But God's victory for his people must be understood in light of his prerogative. That's the second thing we need to see in these verses. Verse 4 talks about God's prerogative to bless his people. Verse 4, he chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, who he, whom he loves. Now we could preach an entire, I could preach an entire sermon on this. Yahweh chose, you know that, I think that even the use of Jacob here is somewhat of a humbling term. You know, we just sung the song and the line was, two wonders here that I confess my worth and my unworthiness. I think that's what he's talking about here. He's saying, he chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loves. Now the pride of Jacob is speaking of the inheritance that God has given to them. But Jacob, when they use Jacob here, because later he use, uses Abraham, and Abraham is a great picture of faith. We like that picture. Jacob is this swindler. He's just kind of, he's just kind of a, he's a hard person to like. He's a hard person to reckon why God would name his people after this man. There is something in here, I think, of this uh, psalmist is, is pointing out, yes, Jacob, he loves, but he loves him because he loves him. Merely because he chose him. Not because Jacob had anything to offer God. What do you think of when you think of why God should give you the victory as the church? Do you think it's because the church has been so good and we've deserved this? or are, We are worthy of this inheritance. What about this inheritance that is the pride of Jacob? What does that mean? That means all the promises that God promised to them. Do you deserve those? Have you earned them yourself? Land, wealth, honor among their enemies. That God would be their God. Did, did Israel deserve those? Did Jacob deserve those? No, the answer is no. But at once we see their worth because God chose them. You see that? And their unworthiness. This is their inheritance by grace. We need to think of this. Psalm 16, verse 3 says, As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent one. This is, this is what God is saying to describe their inheritance and his love for them. I'm giving you this because I love you. In whom is all my delight, God says, of his people. And these words, especially we could take rightly, is how Christ speaks of those whom the Father gave him out of this world. This is how our value is measured. It's not when we look in the mirror and we give ourselves self-affirmations, as I've been saying recently. It's that in Christ, God chose us from the foundation of the world, his beloved, to heap upon us an inheritance that is not just here today and gone tomorrow but that which rightly belongs to Jesus himself. The Bible says anyone who seeks God, to know God, who diligently searches for him, must know two things, that God is and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The Kantian ethic is not a Christian ethic. Just come to God, just, just come to God for nothing. Just pursue God for nothing. That's true virtue. That's the Kantian ethic. But scripture says, God pursued you to heap good upon you by his own choice. And you offered him nothing to do so. You brought nothing to the table. In other words, you didn't pay God back. You won't be able to give to him anything that he doesn't already have. He's done it because he loves you. That is your worth. 
is because he loves you. We confess these two wonders, these two mysteries, our worth and our unworthiness. And we see him in the psalm, and it should bring out praise. Third, the victor's ascension. How did this come to pass? Verse 5. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. So what we've seen is the peoples of the world have been subdued, and they've been subdued under God's people, under Jacob. How has this come to pass? In the Midrash, concerning this psalm, this verse was viewed as regarding the Messiah. And the interpretation was that the text implies that Yahweh must have come down before he ascends. How does God go up any further to heaven? They say. And he has gone up with a shout. Victory is the shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. And he's always already called, as I've said, the peoples of the earth, having being called to worship God and being subdued under the people of God. And so this is, this is sort of how the psalm moves implicitly is that God has come down to make this happen. He's the one that did this for this people. He's the one that subdued the peoples under him. And now he's gone up with a shout. Here's the victor's ascension. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. And very interestingly, when we get to the New Testament, the New Testament bears these things out in regards to Jesus. Acts 1, 9 through 11 And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. Now, what does it say there? It doesn't say anything about the extravagance of a shout or a trumpet, but it says he will come back in the same way. But Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 6, 4, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, how? With the cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of a trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So we could take this and we could understand that perhaps at the ascension of Christ, this very same shout and this very same trumpet was present there. He's going to come the same way as he ascended. But the point there that I want to bring to your mind, it's the point of the psalmist. Jesus doesn't merely become the victor when he comes back. That's what the psalmist is saying. When he ascends, he has already claimed the victory. And this is what I want us to hear, especially this morning. Christ, when he ascended, he ascended into, uh, we know, the right hand of God. And this is a picture of his session. He is reigning now as the high king. And you heard this at Easter, you've been hearing it, but I pray that you would hear this so that it would change our perspective when we walk in this life day to day. The kings of this earth do not reign. The globalists, if you're fearful about what's going on there, are not reigning. This economic forum that you're hearing about, they don't reign. There's a lot of sketchy thing going on with people that are thinking they're above everybody and are going to save the world. Usually when mankind does their worst is when we think we're going to save the world. And that's what I'm hearing a lot of these days. They can't. But don't despair because Christ is saving his peoples out of this world. And he is reigning. The ascension is a picture of his success. That's what we need to understand. The ascension of Christ is one of the most important and yet underappreciated saving acts of God and Christ, perhaps because we don't see what it means in the totality of Scripture. This is a picture of a warrior king who has won in this psalm. 
the suzerain king of all suzerain kings. He is the king of kings, and he is one, and that is true of our Lord. He doesn't sleep, nor does he slumber. He is the refuge and strength of his people. He is shaking the nations right now until everything that is shaken will be shaken, and only the things that cannot be shaken remain. What is that? The things that are in Christ. Those who are in Christ. He is Lord, the Bible tells us. He is Lord of all, the Bible tells us. He is seated at the right hand of God and all things are under his feet now, even though we don't necessarily see it that way. Think about what Ephesians 4 says about the church and see if we lack what we need. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Inheritance. Think of this, what the psalm says about inheritance. What has Christ given you? Are you part of the church? Then you're engaged in this. How about we engage then if we're part of the church and what Christ has blessed us with? But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, when he ascended, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying, now he explains, when he ascended, he does, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? This is his ministry, his earthly ministry, his cross work. He who descended is one who also ascended far above all heavens. Listen, why? That he might fill all things. That means that all things in all creation might come in subjection to him. The purpose of this in Ephesians is to encourage the church that God has fitted us to succeed because of the ascended Lord. Last Lord's Day, I said, was Ascension Day on the Christian calendar, his Orthodox calendar. We don't observe it necessarily. I don't see why we wouldn't. But the ascension of Christ is absolutely essential for us to consider he has bestowed upon his church gifts which Jesus promised cannot be overcome. Now, you might be thinking, well, there's a lot of powerful people out there, right? There's a lot of powerful nations out there. Rome was powerful, weren't they? Rome is gone. They're gone. Is the church gone? And we could go throughout history. All these nations are rising and fall. Where is the church? Has the church been defeated? I, I heard somebody talking this week about the church in China being so numerous that one day, if it keeps growing underground, that great fear of all the nations, China and their growing power, it may just become the, the great Christian empire of the world without them even realizing it. This is the point of the song. We start looking around us like Peter, looking at the waves on the sea, saying, hey, we're not supposed to, I'm not supposed to walk on water. Meanwhile, he was walking just fine when he saw Christ. When he looked to Jesus. We don't look to Jesus. We're looking around us too much. We're looking at all the turmoil saying, this, this, this has got to be the end. And maybe it is. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Right? But if it's not the end right now in our lifetime or tomorrow or the next day, Jesus says, no one knows the hour. Look to him. He's succeeded. He's ascended. He's won the victory. The purpose of his ascension, Ephesians 4.10, that he might fill all things, Colossians 1.20 says it this way, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. His ascension shows that he did it. The whole world will be in subjection to him and is already under his feet. 
the theological and redemption redemptive picture is this Christ made everything and by his redemptive work including his ascension he reigns until everything he has made is made in subject to him and every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord Four, we have to work through these a little bit quickly verses six and seven of the psalm sing praises to God sing praises sing praises to our king sing praises after this vision of God ascend in his ascended victory that's all the psalmist says over and over again sing praises sing praises to our king sing praises for God is the king of all the earth sing praises with the psalm that last psalm there is the word the Hebrew word masculine we've been looking at that because it's often included in the titles of the psalm and it probably it has to do with skill whether in wisdom or teaching but the point is is there to sing a psalm I think with understanding that you understand that you can have a conception of what is true Christ his ascended seems psalms that know that he is victorious that's why we are shouting with joy the peoples of the world because he is victorious do you care do you have do you have any interest in Christ at all that that raises your hearts to worship him you know his victory is our victory if you're not in Christ his victory it either you're indifferent to it or you are in fear of it but his victory if you are in Christ is your victory and you should praise him with understanding of that victory here's a gracious opportunity for us we're too often oppressed by the affairs of this life I've been ministering to a woman whose husband died here on Tuesday they're visiting from the mainland from Nebraska and he drowned in the ocean behind Plantation Holly on Tuesday how do you minister to somebody that you don't know she's got a 10 year old son just her and him now how do you minister to her in this world with hope he ministered to her with this message Jesus said I am the resurrection and the life he that believeth on me though he were dead yet shall he live because I live you will also live he said this man I have heard from his pastor and from his wife was a was a representative of the grace of God in this world through Christ you can minister to people that have hope you can tell them it is not over for him or for you you can look at that 10 year old boy and you can say there is a future not because of what society can do for you merely yes the church will be there for that family for that mom I talked to the the pastor that church is ready to be there for that widow and for that fatherless son, child true religion and undefiled they're ready for that but God promises good to them he promises that he's working out good and we know that because Christ has ascended you know we're so COVID and all of these things that is surrounding us and and we're so despondency here's where we need to see that old adage that worship is warfare fight the despondency by realizing that Christ is ascended trials come the psalmists are very honest about trials very honest about them but we need to be equally honest about victory about hope and that we have opportunity to worship and to raise our voices in joy is a great blessing 
O come, let us worship and bow down, and let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. Number five, the Lord's people. I, we started in verses 1 and 2 by showing that the, the peoples of the world should praise God, should sing to God, should fear God, and that while being subdued. But now we see that they're not merely subdued in subjection. They're subdued to become the people of God, through adoption. Verses 8 and 9. God reigns over the nations. Yes, he does. Do you believe that? We are evidence of that. You sitting in this room is evidence of that. He reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. This is true whether or not people want it to be true, but what follows in this Psalms indicates that this is in fact the will and will be the will of the people, of the nations, to have God rule over them. The princes of the people, we... Uh, we learn here in this verse, the princes of the people gather. These are the representatives of the peoples of the world, which means the peoples of the world as the people of the God of Abraham. The princes of the people represent their people in the world, and they gather as the people of the God of Abraham. They gather. This is an assembly of worship. This is a Gentile assembly of worship promised in this psalm. But they are not marked by their own nationality of, anymore. Where they came from, what their identity, what their tribe was, and neither are you. But by being heirs of the promises given to Abraham, he says, the people of the God of Abraham. This psalm demonstrates that the peoples in verses 1 and 2 that are subdued by God are called to rejoice as they tremble before God in reverence and fear, do so because God has graciously included them in to the promises of that he gave to Abraham. You say, that is that really there? I thought that was a New Testament doctrine. Well, this is why Paul says in Galatians 3.8, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, Gentiles by faith, the peoples by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, and you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Go back down to Galatians 3.26. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God. That's inheritors. That word sons there, we're not, I don't think it should be changed to sons and daughters. You know why? Because this is regarding those who will be inheritors of the promise. But he says you all are. And you, you women out here who feel marginalized because of the foolishness of feminism, and I'm just saying that because I think it is foolish, it's destructive, listen to what the Bible says. You have an equal inheritance with your husband or your brother or your, the brat sitting next to you, whatever it is, in Christ, have exactly the same. You are reckoned to be sons. That is, you have an inheritance equal with men. This is not a man and woman thing. This is promised offspring thing. Notice how, how he teaches. He goes further. For there is, for as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's the distinction. How are you known before God? We, we all question identity now, right? Everything's, here's a necessary identity before God. Are you known in yourself or are you known because Christ is in you? Only those who have Christ in them by faith will receive this inheritance. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there slave nor free. There is no male or female for you all are one in Christ Jesus. You are all inheritors of the promise. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, 
heirs according to the promise. So here's this psalm in a nutshell. God descends to the earth. How does he do this? He does this in the person of the Son. And the Son, while he is present on the earth, he wins a victory which is demonstrated in his ascension for the peoples of the world. So that his people, Israel, and the peoples of the Gentiles of the nations, the nations, the Gentiles, would be brought up together all to be worshipers together of him. And so the shields, the right of dominion of the earth belongs to God alone. He is highly exalted. The message of the church hasn't changed in 2,000 years, but we see it goes further back than that. That God is the victor of the world. He is the one that wins the victory. This is his world. You played the song. This is my father's world. This is his world. The peoples of this world, he made. He made us in his image. He is going to win them back through Jesus Christ who ascended into heaven after he finished the work his father came to do, which shows he has won the victory. So let's lift up our drooping heads. Let's look to Jesus. Let's realize that we are, our lives are hidden with him right now in heavenly places. The church cannot be overcome. Let's live this life with courage and faith and commitment and obedience in the face of hostility knowing that even if they kill the body, they cannot kill the soul. That is how the gospel has been victorious for 2,000 years. It's how it's been traveled throughout the world, and it's how it will continue to do so. I don't care if Islam, I don't care if secularism, I don't care what pagan uh, worship raises its ugly head again. Christ is victorious. We have to live with that truth. We live in accordance with his word, with his truth, and that is the basis for our faith. So let's trust him. Let's rejoice. Let's sing songs. Can we do that? We can when we believe his word. Let's pray. Father.